Travel, travel writing and travel literature are ancient activities. Where we as travellers, or indeed as readers of travel literature, are introduced to new places and all the wonders they can reveal to us. We can learn about a place's society, its history, its people and their politics and culture, their language, food, music and art. We can learn the folklore, the geography and the archaeology of a new site. We can learn about the local tales and fables in mythology and about real political upheavals, about natural and man-made disasters that shape a land and its people, about the rebels and patriots who were revered or vilified by a community and its citizens, and about so much more. This year for Galway Public Library's Great Read programme, we want to take you on a ramble through some of the beauty and the wonders of County Galway, as discovered and seen through the lens of several travel writers that have gone before us. We invite you to journey with us through time and place, to explore some of the sites where husband and wife team Samuel and Anna Maria Hall visited in the 1840s, a post-active union and pre-famine Ireland, with Sir William Wilde, an extraordinarily interesting and intellectual man with a passion for all things ancient, who wrote in the 1860s. The third writer we will journey with is Ulsterman Richard Hayward, an actor, singer, musician turned travel writer, exploring the highways and byways of the new and evolving Irish Free State between the 1930s and the late 1940s. Our guides on this ramble are two experts in all things Galway, Dr Jim Higgins and Michael Gibbons, each with a deep love and passion and wide-ranging knowledge of Galway's heritage and culture. So as Wilde said, let us westward ho. We're in lovely Anna Down here and it's a fantastic day, a wonderful sight and lots to see. And the writers that we're talking about, William Wilde at the Halls and Richard Hayward, they all visited places like this. But this is just a sample. We can only just see a sample of the numerous sites around the Corrib. Uh, around Connemara and other parts of Galway that they visited and recorded. Other people will look at other sites and say, oh, those are equally interesting or probably even more interesting. But that's the value and that's the interest of these three writers, that they looked at a vast range of, of material, of, of people, of characters, uh, of sites, of places, of scenery and so on. And they were able to express a joy in them all. So here we are at the first of the sites, Anna Down. This was granted by King Oki of Connacht to God and St. Brendan in the 550s. Much of the site from the 550s remains. We have an honorary, we have medieval remains, we have a castle, uh, two holy wells, the site of a round tower, various church buildings, even the site of a medieval fish pond here at Anna Down. Lots to see and a lot of these places were also explored by our tree writers. In fact, Wilde himself did some digging here at Anna Down and discovered some 13th century grave slabs which are, which are now visible for all to see. Looking here at the east end of this long church, we see the site of a very important transitional period window. In other words, a window dating from around 1200. That window was here up until the 18th or early 19th century when it was taken and it was brought down the road and put into another building in the graveyard. That building at the time was the Church of Ireland Church. So this wonderful set of carvings was taken from, from here and brought down the road. Beautiful set of exquisite, detailed, expressive carvings. And I mean, Wilde's description of it you know, it would fill you with enthusiasm to see it. From this vantage point, we can see other parts of the, the heritage, the built heritage of Anadown. Wonderful view of the castle, for instance. The castle has been radiocarbon dated to the 1440s from some of the timber in the castle itself. So 
this is the window that I referred to, the transitional window that was taken from the church below and brought up here and re-erected. Um, it's been re-erected, you can see the thickness of the wall is much greater here than it is elsewhere in the church because they needed room to give depth to the window. The wonderful engravings in uh, Wiles Loch Corrib show a lot of the detail that you mightn't necessarily see on a dull day, but the light is fairly good at the moment. If you look here, there's a large beast, there are the two eyes and the snout and his neck with a mane and the two front legs. Where does this beast disappear to? Well, his spine forms a moulding all the way up the window, comes all the way around and all the way da back down here. And here are his hindquarters and a stumpy little tail. And it's all the same creature. Fantastic imagination, fantastic quality of sculpture and so on. Hayward in particular had a great love of this sort of detail. And in his talks, he used to give illustrated talks around Ireland. Uh, he used to give them about the Shannon, about Connacht. He, he based them around all of his books. But he had a wonderful series of slides of this particular window. And he was particularly interested in the details because you have a carving of a bull, you have a carving of a fox, and you have a carving of a, of a bird, which may be intended to be a, a, a pelican. So you had all of that. Now, of course, the engraving in Wilds Lock Corrib gave publicity to this particular piece of carving. And much, much later on then, Hayward, he illustrated some of his slideshows and talks with the details of this beautiful window. Believe it or not, I'm standing here in the middle of what uh, is the remnants of a sad and sorry scattered remnants of a round tower. This round tower would have been one of the latest round towers to be erected in Ireland. According to the annals, it was erected in 1228, which is quite late, and often the round towers are several centuries earlier. Now, when Wilde came here, he saw very little of the remnants, and he began to believe that the Round Tower wasn't here at all, that it was another site that was being referred to, a site at Kilcuna, where there are the, the remains of a Round Tower, maybe about nine or ten foot in height. Nevertheless, the Round Tower is actually here. In recent years, it's been discovered that there are drawings of it, 19th century drawings of it, that probably Wilde wasn't just aware of. So this is the last Round Tower, the last and rediscovered Round Tower of Anadown. 70 to 80 of these erected originally, maybe even 100 of them, up to 100 feet in height in some instances, maybe a little bit more in some cases. Fantastic structures, nothing like them in Europe. One or two in Scotland, one in the Isle of Man, but a particularly Irish feature. Clue is in the name as well, a clug chock. This is the term that was used for them. A bell was rung from them, but they probably had multiple uses. There were often positions in early Christian sites opposite the, the west door of the church. So this is Anna Down's rediscovered round town. Well the modes of transport were very different in the 19th century than they are now and all that of the roads that we're so used to we, we assume were always there they didn't exist in the early 19th century. Nimmo, for instance, he was the engineer, the Scottish engineer. He brought an awful lot of the roads to Connemara from the 1820s onwards to some areas. By the time of Wilde, the road system had expanded. But even here now, where we are in Anna Down, you didn't have a road system into this area until much, much later in the 19th century. So people came to Anna Down by boat. Now, Wilde would have come on the steamer, the Eglinton, from Galway. He would have come up the lake. He would have got out at various sites. In some cases, he'd have walked around the sites, get back on the steamer, get into a rowboat or whatever. But that was the way he came. Hayward, of course, he was here in the time of the, of the car. But you must remember as well that Hayward was here in the 40s at a time when there were petrol shortages and Second World War was occurring. And uh, he would have had the, the benefit of being able to uh, get petrol vouchers and so on for his job, but his transport was by car and by foot.
Well, I'm standing here with what has become almost a religious text for me. Along with Hayward's book, we have uh, Wilde and Wilde's wonderful engraving of Ross Abbey, which is here in the background behind me. And uh, it, it really is atmospheric. It's one of the most fantastic of the Franciscan sites, known as Ross Abbey, that's the popular name. Ross Everly Friary is the full title of the building. Hayward, when writing about it, he often regretted the fact that you just couldn't put a roof on it. And he said this about several other buildings, you know, that all you need is to drop a roof onto it. And for visitors from the continent who were used to the widespread destruction that was wrought by the Reformation, it was very, very difficult to come across a site like this, which was so relatively intact. Okay, in Ireland, enough of these sites were affected by the Reformation, but they were left relatively intact. The stones weren't completely removed and whatever. So what we have in the west of Ireland is we have some fantastic medieval monastic sites like this. Uh, Ross Abbey, Ross Ark, Moyne, Ballantubber Abbey, all of these places. And the same could be said about all of them, that all you need to do is to drop a roof on them and they, uh, and they would be complete. And that was something different for visitors coming to Ireland to see something so intact and to get a place that was full of atmosphere and you could really reconstruct in your own mind's eye what it was like for medieval monks to wander around the cloisters here or to eat in the refectory and so on. Actually this is a reader's desk so it's appropriate to the great read and this is where a monk would have sat with his book and he would have been reading to his fellow monks in the refectory. The other thing that Hayward uh, in particular often mentioned was he disliked intensely a novel of the modern tombs. By modern he meant the 18th and 19th century tombs, the big landlord tombs that often they were inflicted on the place. Once the places went out of use, a novel of the big, the gentry as they were, as they referred to themselves, they often built massive big tombs. Now gradually over the years, in sites that are owned like, by the state, like this one, a lot of those tombs have been dismantled with the, with the permission of the families and removed. But in Hayward's time, this was one of the things that he was saying about Ross Abbey, that it was pity that it was so marred by these big 19th century monstrosities and mausolea and so on. Wilde has a lot to say about the place. He has a lot of the early history. The early history includes dates in the 1380s, 1390s and so on. But none of the fabric as we see it here is any earlier really than about the, the late 15th and early 16th century. But what is there is remarkably intact. We're in Glebestone Circle, one of four stone circles in this general area, and one of literally scores of monuments in the vicinity. There are cairns, there are tombs, there are stone circles like this. There are all sorts of monuments. And the area has become known as Conga Moitura. Now Moitura really is a place where the battle, the mythical battle of Moitura took place. Wilde, William Wilde that is, named his house Moitura House. So he was a great antiquarian, a great archaeologist, a great surgeon. He was a great statistician, collector of folklore. His wife was a great collector of folklore and so on. But, you know, for an antiquarian, he sort of let himself down to some degree by trying to mix the myth and the legend and superimpose a folklore on monuments that really it didn't have a great uh, grounding in truth. And that's a pity because it's the only part of his legacy that people can find fault with, with regard to his interest in archaeological monuments and so on. But to the monuments themselves, a lot of prehistoric monuments, some massive stone cairns, mounds of stones, like Maeve's Cairn up in, in Sligo, for instance. We have similar things of similar proportions here. Ballin McGibbon, for instance, Ballin McGibbon Cairn, massive, massive mound of stone, probably covered a tomb. One of the stone circles, we're standing on one. Just in the next field, there's another one. And there's two more just within a couple of hundred yards of this area. So the archaeology is extremely rich in this area, extremely fine, extremely well preserved. And the, the Wild book, Wild's Lock Corrib, 
gives emphasis to it, but conflates the archaeology with the myth and the legend. So this is Glebe, in other words, Nimsfield. A nice little romantic name, I suppose, for it is Nimsfield, but the townland really is, is Glebe. Well, for Hayward in particular, Kong and the lake in general was a place for flies, fishing, frolics and foys. And I'll explain that a bit better because he was always interested in fishing on the lake, whether it was salmon, trout, anything at all. And he discussed a lot of his stories uh, came about as a result of trips on the lake say with the Leidens for, from here, and also with uh, the Foy family, among them Peter Foy, who was from a family of sculptors who were involved in the restoration of uh, the old abbey here, uh, which was paid for by the, by the Guinness family. So Hayward enjoyed being on the lake. He would talk about the Mayfly, he would ask people for stories on the boat trip. It was a day out that brought a story to him and material for his book. So there's great scenes of the lake in his books. The Wilds, they had a great relationship with Kong as well. They told stories about the, uh, the caves, the highwaymen, as well as the monuments, as well as the abbey, the architecture and uh, the archaeology. So there was a great mix. Now one of the loveliest drawings in Hayward's book, for instance, is a lovely drawing of the abbey is by Raymond Piper. He did some excellent drawings of this monument behind me, the Monk's Fishing House, and also of the Abbey. And uh, they really give a real sense of the place. To go back to the, the Foy's and the Foy family, they sculpted a lot of the missing pieces of the arcade, the Cloister Arcade, on behalf of the Guinnesses. The Guinnesses, Benjamin Lee Guinness, for instance, and Lord Ordelon, they paid for a lot of restoration work here at the Abbey and uh, the Foy family, there were several generations of them, and they carved the, any of the missing stonework, including the foliage and the ornament and so on. And one of those Foy family members often went fishing with Richard Hayward. I'm inspired by Kong myself. I think it's a wonderful place to visit. I'm standing here in front of Castle Kirk, Back behind me in the distance is a wonderful island in the lake and on it is a mythical and fabulous looking castle called Castle Kirk. Now all of our tree travel writers had a particular interest in this and they spent a lot of time describing the folklore associated with it. So the traditions include the story that a witch built the castle on behalf of the O'Connors or on behalf of the O'Flaherty's depending on which version you hear about it and that the witch gave the owners of the castle a hen and said to them now mind that hen as long as you have that hen you'll never be besieged or starved out but the owners eventually got tired of looking at the hen at the hen and the prophecy comes true and the castle falls to its enemies not only does William Wilde talk about it in his book and talk about the folk tales but his wife as well Speranza she has her own folk tales that she gathered in the area relating to the island uh, about the castle being haunted about people coming from the castle wearing green and red sashes I wonder are they Mayo support or whatever and coming out of the castle it was a spectral castle a haunted castle now the castle itself is a wonderful structure over the years well, Wild mentions that a lot of the stones have been robbed out of it and to build the houses in the locality, but the coin stones have been taken and, uh, and reused elsewhere. Now, the site is a national monument, and it's a very important one because there are very few castles of this type really west of the Shannon. It's a, a typical sort of medieval castle, highly fortified, uh, very thick at the base, and then rising getting narrower towards the top. It has a narrow entrance gate, highly defended, uh, towers on the corners, and it has all the elements that you'd associate with a typical fairy tale medieval castle. And indeed, that's what it is, an enchanted castle. <laughs>